Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name, as you now already know, is Nick Johnson. Uh, I'm a uh, core developer for the Ethereum Foundation, and I'm here today to talk to you about the Ethereum... I'm doing the best I can <laughs> um, to talk to you about the Ethereum name system. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, ENS. Uh, we'll briefly go over what it is, how it works, uh, how you build resolvers in the ENS system, um, how ENS can be used in distributed applications, both on-chain and off-chain, uh, how registrars and name resolution works, and then finally our plans for deployment uh, and what you can expect in the future. So uh, one of the major problems and the barriers to adoption with blockchain systems and Ethereum uh, is that we use long, we use, uh, long cryptographically uh, secure identifiers, uh, which are effectively impossible to remember. Uh, users typically resort to copying and pasting them, sending them in emails. Uh, when they do have to type them in, they often uh, typo things, and that's the result of numerous Ether and Bitcoins and so on sent to invalid addresses. Uh, ENS aims to solve this problem by providing human-readable identifiers to any identity on the blockchain. So instead of having to say, hello, my address is 30C42B7B, etc., 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 instead you'll be able to say, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya, dot ETH. <laughs> I'm glad somebody got it. Um, <laughs> Um, and this can be used not just to associate Ethereum addresses, but also uh, a variety of other resources, such as swarm hashes and so forth. Um, so in addition to, to hosting uh, Ethereum addresses, uh, there's a few other things we already support, uh, including uh, Swarm and IPFS records by uh, hosting the content hash, uh, legacy DNS records. In fact, if you go to docs.ens.domains in your web browser right now, what you'll get is a website whose DNS records were served off the Ethereum blockchain without requiring uh, any involvement at all from your browser other than regular DNS queries. Uh, you can support things like identity attestation. Um, if you look at what Keybase is doing, for instance, that sort of thing can entirely be implemented on ENS. Uh, and it can even store interfaces for contracts, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Um, so what is ENS? It's hierarchical just like the current domain name system. Uh, so top-level domains are owned by registrars, in this case .eth. Uh, and they give out second-level domains to uh, anyone who comes along and fulfills whatever the rules are for registering a domain. Um, in the mainnet deployment of ENS, we've made the choice to try and avoid any collision with the regular DNS system, so the only available top-level domain will be .eth. Uh, on the test network, additionally, there's a .test top-level domain, which anyone can register to try out their apps on ENS, which I encourage you to do, of course. Uh, names registered there go away after 28 days in order to encourage you to use them purely as a temporary measure. Uh, anyone who owns a domain can create subdomains and so on recursively. So Anigo Montoya can create wallet.anigomontoya.eth. Uh, Metamask can buy metamask.eth and then hand out wallets using their own registrar for all of their users, Alice and Bob and so forth. So this is the basic uh, structure of ENS. Uh, the, there are two main components in ENS, uh, the ENS registry and resolvers. Uh, the ENS registry is a single central component. Uh, it's not directly upgradable, but it is as incredibly straightforward as possible. Uh, if the slides were only slightly bigger, I could show you the entire source to it. Um, and the ENS registry's purpose is to serve as a mapping between uh, human-readable addresses and resolver addresses. Uh, resolvers are the second major component of, a theory of, sorry, of ENS, and a resolver's job is to go from a human-readable name to a resource. And the reason for the split is that it means that the ENS registry can be extremely straightforward and doesn't have to care about different resource types, since the only thing it provides is a lookup from a human-readable name to the resolver responsible for it. Uh, the resolver, in contrast, can be as complex as you like, can change as often as you like, you can add new resource types and so forth, because it's not a, because uh, it's pointed to by the registry, anyone can deploy a new resolver at any time without disrupting the system. Uh, so this separation means we can have a great deal of upgradability without a lot of complexity. Uh, so resolving a name in ENS is a two-step process, uh, which you can see here. So uh, as, as a piece of user code running either on the chain or off the chain, I start off by asking the ENS registry, uh, please tell me the address of the resolver for foo.eth. 
and it responds with an address, if it exists, of the resolver. So in this case, one, two, three, four, et cetera. And then I go and ask the resolver that was identified, please tell me what the address of foo.eth is. Uh, and it responds with the appropriate address. So this uh, same pattern takes place for any record type. Uh, the registry's only job in this, in this picture is maintaining this list of resolvers and associated with that a list of owners so that it knows who has permission to update the list. Uh, so here's an example of a really extremely simple resolver. Uh, this is the, perhaps the simplest possible resolver. Uh, if you deploy it, it will record who deployed it and then it will answer all queries for addresses by responding with your address. So by deploying this 10-line contract uh, on Ethereum and updating the registry for a domain you own to tell it that this is the resolver to use, you can assign a name to your wallet. Um, of course, most, con uh, most resolvers are more complicated than this, although not vastly so, uh, and there are um, public resolvers that will be available for anyone to use so that you don't have to deploy your own that maintain simple key value mappings for people just wanting to map things uh, on a one-off basis. Uh, so here's a really simple example of what you can already do with the parts of ENS we've described so far. Uh, you may already be familiar with the owned pattern, uh, where a contract has a construct such that the person who owns it is able to execute certain specialised operations or certain privileged operations and nobody else can. Typically this also allows for the owner to be transferred uh, to another person. Uh, here we're showing how you can actually accomplish the owned pattern using only ENS. So in this case, we've defined a modifier called owned, and what owned does is actually check if the caller is the same person who owns a particular record in ENS. And if it is, then they permit them to do the operation, and if it doesn't, they throw. If it isn't, they throw. Uh, so with a few lines like this, uh, and deploying it and pointing it to the ENS registry, you can set up the owned pattern, and you can have multiple different contracts that all reference the same name, and you can transfer ownership of all of those contracts to a new address simply by updating that one record. So uh, using ENS off-chain is equally simple. Um, we have a JavaScript library available uh, which simplifies all of the, the operations to make them as straightforward as possible. Um, it, you can simply uh, require it from uh, NPM, um, set it up by giving it a reference to the Web3 object you use. Uh, and looking up names is as simple as asking it first for the resolver and then for the address in the same sort of two-step process that we described earlier. Um, the uh, Ethereum ENS uh, JavaScript library uses uh, promises, so what's returned here is not actually the address but a promise for the address, uh, which makes for a simpler interface than dealing with callbacks continuously. Uh, and you can write it in the same fashion that you would synchronous code for the large part. Uh, reverse resolution is also possible through ENS. Uh, reverse resolution makes it possible to associate metadata and record information uh, with an Ethereum address. So one case where this would be useful, for instance, is if you're writing a wallet, and sometimes your users enter ENS addresses for their friends, and sometimes they copy and paste a regular Ethereum address for their friend, and you want in all cases to be able to show the person's name or other metadata associated with it, your contract or your wallet can then go and uh, query ENS reverse records to find out what the canonical name for a particular record is. Uh, reverse records can also be used for other things such as storing contract metadata, which we'll get into a bit later. Um, and again, doing reverse resolution follows the same basic pattern. You ask the ENS library for the reverse record for a particular address, and then you ask it what the name of that address is. Um, so enabling reverse resolution um, is likewise quite, quite straightforward. Uh, supposing you have an account that you own and you want to set up reverse resolution for it so people know what to call you. Uh, in JavaScript, it's just a single line. You ask the register, uh, tell the registrar that you want to claim your address. Uh, you tell it who should be in charge of that address, which in this case is you again. Uh, and it will give you ownership of the appropriate record in the ENS registry, which then allows you to uh, make updates, set records, and so forth. Uh, in Solidity, it's just as simple. Uh, you can claim a record just using a single uh, call to another contract. Um, and this pattern's really useful for putting in a constructor of a, um, uh, of a contract that you may want to be able to set metadata on later because it sets the owner of the reverse record 
to the uh, person who deployed the contract or the account that deployed the contract. And what this means is that you don't need to complicate your contract in order to add metadata. You don't need to bulk up the transaction that deployed it. All you need is the single call, which then allows you to manage those things uh, later. So, uh, so far we've been talking mostly about name resolution as a way to uh, look things up, uh, names and addresses. Um, but there are further applications as well, and one of the ones I'm sort of personally most excited with at the moment <coughs> is the possibility for making interacting with contracts a lot easier than it is now. So currently, if you want to interact with a contract in Web3, in your DAP or on the console, uh, you first have to construct a test contract instance, in this case. Uh, you pass it in the ABI, which is a big, long chunk of JSON, and it gives you back a factory, and then you ask that factory for an instance of that contract at a particular address, which again you probably had to copy and paste or enter from some other resource, and it gives you back an instance of the contract. Uh, with ENS though, and recently uh, developed EAPS, we can do better. So with ENS, you can now store a compressed version of your contract ABI inside the ENS registry. You can either, st uh, sorry, in a resolver rather. You can store it either against a name or you can store it against a reverse record, and the JavaScript library supports looking it up from both. So storing it is, is just as straightforward as this. You uh, ask it for the resolver for a particular address. You tell it that you want to set the address of that contract as this, and then you do the same again, but this time you tell it to set the ABI. Uh, ABIs can be stored in a number of formats, including uh, gzip compressed and uh, CBOR encoded, which permits easier access on chain. Um, and the typical overhead of doing this is actually quite low. Uh, the largest uh, contract ABI I could find, which is that of the DAO, uh, is about eight kilobytes uncompressed, it's about six kilobytes in CBOR, and it's about one and a half kilobytes uh, when gzip compressed, which makes it uh, extremely tractable to store in a simple uh, Web3, uh, sorry, simple blockchain transaction against the record. Um, and then likewise, uh, fetching it afterwards is just as straightforward. Um, I seem to be saying straightforward a lot. Um, <laughs> And so you simply ask it for the resolver, and then instead of asking for the name, for instance, you call dot .instance. And what dot .instance does is first fetches the name, second fetches the ABI, and then constructs a contract instance in Web3 from the name and the ABI and hands it back to you. So now you no longer need to copy and paste ABIs, you no longer need to copy and paste addresses, you can actually interact with a contract with nothing other than its name. So uh, the th third and final component of ENS is registrars. Uh, registrars are s very simply contracts that own names. Uh, in principle, you can be a registrar of your own simply by buying a name in ENS and handing out subdomains to your friends, and contract-based registrars uh, simplify this pattern. <coughs> Uh, so typically they um, you know, define some set of rules which may be uh, first and first served, it may be a limited access, it may be token based, it may be, as we'll see soon, an auction. Uh, and anyone who follows those rules uh, will cause the contracts to assign a subdomain to you, uh, which you then of course can do anything you like with, including uh, creating your own subdomain, setting up your own registrar and so forth. So here's another extremely trivial example, this time of a registrar. Uh, this simple registrar is a first-in, first-served type mechanism. It will give out subdomains of the domain it's in control of to anybody who asks. So you have a simple function here, claim. You call claim with the name you want, and if the name's unavailable, it will throw, but if the name's available, it will call ENS and immediately ask ENS to make that record uh, owned by you, after which you can do whatever you want with it. So as you can see, registrars likewise are, are very simple to put together. So uh, you're probably wondering how this works in practice um, for the actual main uh, ENS system that we, uh, we would like to see on mainnet. Um, and what we've done is we've set up a system called uh, Vickery Auction, which will be used to hand out names on mainnet. Uh, the way this works is that there is an auction period. Um, you, if you find a name that you want and nobody has opened an auction for it, you open it. The auction runs typically for a week. And during that week, anybody can submit bids uh, that are masked using a hash. Um, so you don't reveal what you're bidding for, and you don't actually reveal how much you're bidding. You have to send along funds along with it, but you can send more than your bid if you want to disguise it. And finally, at the end of the auction, there is a 24 to 48 hour period during which everyone reveals their bids. Uh, and once all of the bids have been revealed, the winner is determined, and the winner pays the price of the second top bidder. 
the reason for this being that it encourages people to bid their actual the actual amount that they're willing to pay for the name, safe in the knowledge that they will only pay as much as the next highest bidder. Uh, so if you really want a name, you can put down 100 ETH, and if the next bidder is only 10 ETH, then that's all you'll pay. Uh, once you've won an auction, uh, the funds you put in are stored in a deed contract on the blockchain specific to you. Uh, and by relinquishing the name at any point after you've had it for a little while, we have a sort of a minimum occupancy period to stop people just sort of grief bidding on names and then immediately giving them up. Uh, but at any point after that period, you can give up the name and recover your entire deposit. The reasoning behind this is that na uh, buying names then has not a capital cost, but an opportunity cost. All of the ether that you put down against names can't be used for anything else. Uh, and the deed contract is, is owned entirely by you. So the registrar has no ability to reassign the deed to, um, you know, hand it to someone else to, to slash your deposit as long as you follow the rules. Um, so when we eventually transition from this current system, which is entirely automated and it's uh, an interim system that we've, we're deploying in order to get things rolling, to any sort of permanent system, it will be entirely up to you whether you transfer your name to the new permanent registrar and your deposit along with it, or whether you relinquish the name and recover your entire deposit. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about the uh, auction system and how it works, uh, see my talk from DevCon 2, where I went into a bit more detail, as well as talking about the timeline for uh, replacing the, the interim auction registrar with a permanent one. Uh, so a user-friendly uh, distributed app is available, um, in currently in alpha, but we expect it to be ready in time for uh, mainnet, um, which allows registering uh, Ethereum uh, ENS names uh, very straightforwardly. Uh, if any of you have experimented with ENS on testnet so far, it involves a series of somewhat involved uh, e uh, Ethereum blockchain transactions. Uh, which can get a little baffling at times. Uh, this app automates the whole thing, guides you through the process of opening an auction, placing a bid, revealing your bid, and then if you win, claiming your name at the end of it. Uh, if you're interested, it's available right now at ethereum.github.io slash ENS registrardap. Um, I realize that's not the most memorable, so feel free to ping me afterwards for details. So the current status of ENS, uh, it's been deployed on uh, the Ropston testnet since DevCon 2. Um, we have currently the .eth domain using a prototype version of the auction registrar and the .test domain, which I described earlier. Um, and it's coming soon on mainnet. Um, and when it is deployed on mainnet, initially there will be a four-week auction period. The goal of this is to make sure that everyone who wants to get in on any sort of initial land rush is well aware of it before the period ends and uh, auctions will end four weeks after deployment or one week after they start, whichever is later. So it will transition to an ongoing one week period. Um, so uh, at or shortly after launch, uh, we're optimistic that we will have integration with a number of uh, widely used applications. Uh, currently, we're expecting to have at least basic and probably more sophisticated support from uh, Mist, from MetaMask, and from my Ether wallet by the time we launch on mainnet. Uh, with more features to come. So uh, the number one question everybody asks me every time I talk about ENS is uh, when will it be ready for deployment? When can I use it on mainnet? When will it be ready to go? And uh, I'm pleased to announce uh, for the first time here at EdCon, uh, I have an official date that I can give you. Uh, and without further ado, it is Pi Day, March the 14th. <laughs> And I believe I have a little time left over to answer any questions people have. Yeah, first question is the important one for us. So is the fifth character constraint still on? Yes, I'm afraid it is. Uh, I didn't mention it in my talk. Um, names on the initial registrar will be limited to seven characters or longer. Uh, the goal of this is that while there is a simple automated registrar in place and while the system has only limited visibility, uh, we want to avoid a land rush for lots of short names that uh, people will then squat on. Uh, the permanent registrar, when we transition to it, will remove that limitation. Um, so the, the question was, why do we refund the deposit rather than keep some or all of it? Um, 
In my mind, it kind of it cuts a Gordian knot of what you do with the deposit because uh, almost no matter what, what you do with it will be contentious in some sense, particularly if it goes to, to fund people working on stuff. Um, I think it's also quite an elegant mechanism because uh, opportunity costs are a real cost, um, but by doing it this way, we can ensure complete security over the funds. Uh, the deed contract is extremely simple, and it, you can see quite straightforwardly that there's no chance of your, um, you know, your deposited funds going anywhere but back to you or transferred, you know, by your consent to another account. So the, uh, the resolvers on the ENS blockchain only cost money in that they cost gas to, to deploy and to, to modify, which is paid by the people interacting with it. Um, the gateways, um, in principle, cost money to run. Uh, in practice, they're, they're a sort of an auxiliary component of ENS, like ENS is fully functional on Ethereum without DNS gateways. Um, and for my part, I'm quite happy to pay for a couple of VMs to, to run ENS gateways in the short term, and maybe in the long term we'll get ICANN to pay for them instead. Uh, questions? So uh, currently, uh, .eth names on the testnet, uh, we plan to deprecate them after, um, the, after they're deployed on mainnet. Uh, and eventually remove them entirely, um, at which point the only name you can register on the testnet will be .test. Um, we don't have an immediate timeline for that. Um, if we hear that people are, are relying on .eth names heavily, then we'll probably leave it in place for longer. Um, but we also don't want to induce confusion between the .eth on the testnet and .eth on the mainnet and people registering on the wrong network. Did you...? So the question was, uh, how would he go about selling a registered name that we've bought, he's bought? Uh, so, so here in the audience, you have the, the world's first ENS name squatter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so so the, the deed contract and the registrar contract uh, have APIs that are fairly straightforward. So you could write a, um, an auction contract, which would auction off your name. And to the winner, it could in fact use the same basic mechanism that the registrar itself does. Uh, and when the winner's declared, it would then call the registrar and transfer ownership to the new owner. Um, to do it most simply, you would need to, um, the, the winner's bid would need to include at least as much as you deposited, because when they transfer it, the deposit will also be transferred to, to their ownership. Uh, any other questions? Uh, the question was if there's, there's typical code for resolvers. Um, we've got several example implementations, including the, the public resolver, which allows anybody to register records for names they own. Uh, they're all in the ENS repository on the Ethereum GitHub account. Um, beyond that, there's the EIPs describe the interface required for resolvers, and the appendices there also have some example implementations. One last question. So uh, the question was what the status is with having a DNS resolver. Uh, there is a DNS gateway at the moment which allows you to host DNS records on ENS, uh, which I mentioned earlier, but the reverse of being able to look up ENS records on DNS hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, I do have plans to implement it, but it's not currently a high priority project because of the sort of lack of use cases beyond this would be really cool to do. Uh, so if you have a use case in mind, please by all means uh, come up to me afterwards and let me know what it is. <laughs>